All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Um, I'm going to give you all a little bit of warning today uh, because I think it's only fair uh, that at the end, so this, this study is going to go a little bit differently than some of my other ones. You know, the other ones we've done, if you've attended any of those, they're kind of like lecture based, but we'll have time for questions and we kind of talk back and forth. This study is going to be a little bit different in that what I'm going to do each week, and um, there'll be a little less time for this this week because we have two things to get through, some introductory material, and then uh, we're going to dive into the seculosity of technology. We're going to talk about technology today. Um, so that'll leave uh, less time today for discussion than we'll have in future weeks. But what's going to happen is at the end, there's going to be some questions for table discussion. So, just know that near the end, you will have to be at a table with other people. And I will confess to you, I feel a little bad in doing this because I hate it when presenters make you have table discussion. So, I'll confess my own sin about that. I, I, I usually, but I'm doing it, I'm doing it. But the reason I'm doing it is because um, this material and the book itself really invites discussion with other people as opposed to discussion with me, a speaker, right? And so uh, later on at the end, we'll have some questions for reflection. Um, I'll give y'all some time at each table to discuss those, and then we'll kind of maybe share some of our answers and then go on to the next section. We'll see how it goes. If by week three, y'all are all like, please do not make me do this anymore, as your pastor and not your dictator, I will hear that complaint. I will hear the cries of my people, and we may, we may pivot, but we're going to try it. We're going to try it um, and, uh, and try it that way. So this will be a little bit of a different format, okay? So this study is uh, on this book called Seculosity by David Zoll, and I really, really, really tried, like I mean really hard, tried to brainstorm a title for this class that then I could subtitle it, you know, based on the book by David Zoll or whatever. Um, because seculosity itself, the word, is a word that David Zoll made up. And so it's not the best title for a class on it because it doesn't tell you really what the class is about. But I was just sapped of all creative energies, I guess, and I could not come up with a different title. Um, and so here we have it, seculosity. This is taken from the um, dust jacket of the book. And I will tell you, as I mentioned in my email, you absolutely do not have to have read this book to understand the class or get something out of it, nor, okay, do you have to come each and every week. Like if you miss a week, you, you'll still be able, like each class will be self-contained, okay? The information will, won't build on itself. Um, so if you miss one, you won't be thrown off, okay? Uh, but I will say, I highly, highly recommend the book. I highly recommend the book. Now, we won't be taking this book in order. I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later today. But the book is very, very good. Um, I am one of those people who, when I read a book, I like, I like pull out white gloves and I like barely, gently turn each page. You know, like when I'm done with the book, it still looks pristine. Could have just been bought. Carly, my wife, does not understand this. When she reads a book, you can tell because it's been draped over cushions and dog-eared and she's written in it and it's like scandalous to me. And so we have Carly's books and my books and I get very offended if she messes up one of my books. Um, but, this, but this book, Seculosity, was one of, uh, one of those that I actually couldn't help but highlight a bunch of. In fact, I brought my copy and actually you can tell it still looks pristine otherwise. But... Um, but if you look through it, I mean, a bunch of it is highlighted. I've got um, a lot of highlights in here. And the reason being is I felt as I was reading it immensely convicted in a really, a, in a good way, but immensely convicted because I realized that I had kind of given myself over to the kind of things that David Zoll describes. I think this book does a really good job of, um, with humor and wit, um, really doing a good job of diagnosing something that lies at the heart of our culture and that we in the church are not immune to, even though the word he comes up with is seculosity. We'll talk more about that later, but I hope um, that it, it acts similarly in your own life, that it's helpful, that, it's, um, that it provides a way of seeing the world and reflecting on our place in it as Christians um, in a new way, in a different way. 
part of why I also wanted to do this study is I think that it is an absolutely perfect study to do during Lent or a book to discuss during Lent uh, because, as I mentioned in my Ash Wednesday sermon, our Lenten disciplines can start to become about self-improvement, right? Uh, like, for instance, I, um, the things that I gave up for Lent or, or the disciplines that I've taken on, um, they, are, they, they have kind of ulterior motives, right? Um, like I'm giving up pretty much all alcohol except on Sundays because as Mother Kelly will remind you in her sermon today, every Sunday is a feast of our Lord, and so you get a sort of cheat day on, <laughs> on Sundays in Lent. But not only do I think that's probably a good thing for me to do, but I'm hoping that it kind of lets my pants fit a little bit better uh, by Easter, you know, and that's the kind of thinking that David Zoll actually takes aim at in this book. And so I think it's actually a really good um, a Lenten study. So I hope you like it. I hope you get something out of it. And like I said, you don't have to buy the book or read the book, but I hope you do because it is a good book. It came out in 2019, uh, but it still is relevant today. And I think a new edition was recently released with an extra chapter as well. Um, I don't have that one. This is the original copy, but we'll talk about everything in this study from today. We'll talk about technology, but we'll talk about parenting and romance. We'll talk about um, our relationship with food and leisure time and, um, and politics as well. well. We'll get into that. I know, I, decide, I thought about maybe just gliding over that chapter conveniently, but I felt like actually I couldn't. It's really central to a lot of what David Zoll talks about. So uh, we'll even go there, okay, in this class. Um, and then yes, the final chapter uh, actually talks about the church and, and about the ways that we're not immune to this kind of thing even in these hallowed walls. So, I'm looking forward to this, is basically uh, what I, I want to say. Now, I'm always conscious of time in this class, but I'm going to try to be very conscious of time today, uh, because I do definitely want to leave time for the discussion questions at the end. And so, if at a certain point I glance at my watch and then start talking even faster, that's why, okay? I want us to get to the discussion. So, Without further ado, let's dive in. Session one, the seculosity of technology. Now, before we talk about technology, though, we need to do a little bit of introduction because we've got to define some terms. Um, the introduction to this book is actually pretty crucial because it's in the introduction that David Zoll lays out the basic thesis of this book and also defines this word seculosity, which is um, the title of the book, okay? Uh, he says in the introduction, and I quoted from it a little bit in uh, my email that went out to all of you yesterday uh, morning, um, I talked about um, how, or quoted rather, that the religious impulse is easier to rebrand than it is to extinguish, David Zoll says, which is part of why um, we have, even as organized religion statistically has declined, David Zoll's main thesis is that actually our religiosity and religious fervor has not declined at all, but simply been transferred to other things, um, other aspects of our lives. He says that we may be sleeping in on Sunday mornings in greater numbers. Y'all aren't, so good for you. Thank you for being here. We may be sleeping in on Sunday mornings in greater numbers, but we've never been more pious, he says. We've never been more pious. Religious observance hasn't faded as secularization has increased so much as it has migrated, okay? And we've got the anxiety to prove it, he says. We are seldom not in church. This is kind of the, his thesis. Um, now, of course, he's got to do some work here by defining what he means when he talks about religion, because obviously his definition is fairly expansive, right? It's got to be in order for him to talk about these different things as if they were religions. And so um, he actually pulls from a writer uh, and professor at Belmont University um, named David Dark, and um, <clears throat> David Dark's definition of religion is the question of how we dispose our energies, how we see fit to organize our own lives, and in many cases, the lives of others. David Dark talks about religion as being the, quote, controlling narrative, okay, that makes sense of our existence, both here and ultimately, whatever that looks like. And so, um, David Zoll is pulling from this definition, but he takes it a step further, and um, he says this. This is David Zoll's definition. 
Um, I'll read this to you. He says, religion is what we lean on to tell us that we are okay, that our lives matter. Another name for all of the ladders that we spend our days climbing toward a dream of wholeness. It refers to our preferred guilt management system. I love that. Our preferred guilt management system. Our small r religion is the justifying story of our life. Ritual and community and all the other stuff come second. Our religion is that which we rely on, not just for meaning, he says, or hope, but enoughness. Enoughness. And those italics are his, not mine. Okay, um, And this is really the central uh, definition of religion, small r religion. So he does make a distinction between big r religion and small r religion. Um, but this idea of finding your enoughness, what makes you enough, is central to how David Zoll understands uh, religion to operate. And having read a lot of his other stuff, um, if you're familiar with Mockingbird Ministries, which he founded, um, this wouldn't be a surprise to you because he's all he's he's a big kind of law, gospel, grace, mercy kind of guy, and uh, and so this idea of being enough comes up a lot in his writings and in the writings of, of Mockingbird. So um, so this is David Zoll's working definition of religion. And he talks about how all of us want to feel righteous, right? That part of what our religious beliefs, our controlling stories help us to do is to find righteousness, not just as he says to find hope, but to be justified in our convictions and our moral framework, the way that we see the world. Now, justification is also a theological term. We'll get into that way later. Um, but he's kind of playing with some, some Christian theology words here. Um, now, he talks about how the more self-righteous we are, the tighter our circle and the smaller our world often becomes. It, we tend to get more closed off the more self-righteous we become. Um, and it, it makes us more prone to lashing out or being divisive, uh, which we'll pick up on when we talk about technology here shortly. Um, he, he says, actually, uh, in the introduction, people who think they're good are usually pretty mean. He puts it pretty succinctly. Um, because our inner voice uh, often works similarly in our own lives, you know. I mean, when we think that we are right and good and righteous, that's often when we mistreat others. It's often when we're aware of our shortcomings and our failings that we tend to have greater empathy towards other people. Uh, which is another reason why I think this book is a really good one to talk about in Lent, because... Lent, as we've discussed, right, is a time for reflection and introspection and repentance, this kind of acknowledgement of where we go wrong um, to turn our attentions back towards God, not just so that we can turn them towards God, but right so that we can be right with God and with one another. So, um, uh, okay, so, uh, so he does say, uh, he says this, um, with altars off the table, so he talks again, this is him talking about um, kind of our the, the decrease in organized religious observance. He said, with altars off the table, fresh targets have cropped up all over the place, from the kitchen to the gym to the computer screen to the bedroom. Righteousness, you might say, is running amok and breeding mercilessness wherever it goes. Where once we chose between an array of different schools to attend, now there's the one school that will ensure our future success and the many that will squander it. Where once there was a sea of nice people to date, now there is only Mr. or Ms. Wright, and everyone else is just a waste of our time. This is the absolutism that he starts to talk about. These new religions go by different names, but function more or less the same, maintaining all of the demand and much of the ritual, he says, but none of the mercy that the capital R variety religion offers. If we used to go to church once a week, we now go almost every hour, and it is exhausting, to put it mildly, he says. Um, and so it's these new religions, or, or to put it more specifically, um, this transferred religious impulse, which is what David Zoll calls seculosity. Okay, this is where the title of the book comes from is this kind of secular religiosity. He combined those two words, and there you got 
boom, seculosity, right? Okay, that's where it comes from. But he, um, he, def he defines it like this in the introduction to the book. He says, seculosity is a catch-all for religiosity that's directed horizontally rather than vertically, at earthly rather than heavenly objects. Okay, and for him and for the rest of this book, these highlighted words are really, really crucial. That this religious impulse, right, which typically uh, when we're in a healthy place, our religious impulse directs us heavenward, right? Um, it keeps our minds and our hearts focused on, uh, on loftier things than we uh, usually engage in. Um, but seculosity doesn't do that. Instead of being vertically focused, as he says, it's hor horizontally focused. It's focused on things around us that we see, um, the material goods that we accumulate, the rat race that we feel like we run, all of those kinds of things. That is the horizontal direction that he's talking about here. And so this notion of being horizontally instead of vertically focused is crucial uh, to the argument that he makes in the rest of the book. Now, these earthly things, though, and he's very careful to point this out, and I think this is important. These earthly things are not inherently bad. This is not, this is part of what I, I love about this book, is that it's, it's actually pretty nuanced. It's not one of these, like, screeds against the material world. It's not like, you know, setting up this dualism where everything in the created order is bad, you know, and, and we've got to get just slough it off, uh, you know, in favor of the heavenly. Um, David Zoll's understanding of creation is more expansive than that, right? I mean, God created the heavens of the earth and called it good. God created us, called it good. You know, um, God created our intellect and our ability to create. All that's good. And so the stuff on the earth is not inherently bad. He, he makes that very clear. Um, he says here, and I know this is a little small, but I'll, I'll read it for you. He says, the objects of our seculosity food, romance, education, children, technology, and on and on. They are not somehow bad, he says. Quite the opposite. They're by and large great, <laughs> right? All of these things, food is great. Uh, romance, great. Education, great. Like all these things, great. Um, it's only when we lean on these things for enoughness, when we co-opt them for our self-justification, or we make them into arbiters of salvation itself that they turn toxic, right? It's not the things themselves, but it is how we use them and twist them. My aim throughout, he says, therefore, is to temper criticism with affection. Poking fun at our secular pieties, including my own, is part of disarming them. Another reason I wanted to talk about this in Lent, one of the things that I said on Ash Wednesday, I talk about it all the time, that you cannot repent of a sin that you can't name, right? That when you are willing to name something that you are struggling with, something that is weighing you down, it gives you a power over it, right? And so this is, even though he doesn't talk about it quite in those terms here, this idea of making fun of these secular pieties is a way of disarming them, of making them less dangerous. And so that playful tone really just reflects throughout um, his book. Okay, so with that, oh, we're doing good. Okay, good, good, good. So that's the introduction, okay? That's how we define seculosity as being our religious impulse, sort of focused, rather than being focused vertically, it's focused horizontally. And his thesis is that this is something we have tended to do in our culture, is we're not less religious, we've just displaced our religious impulse into other things. And he says, I didn't go into this, so it was in my notes. He, he goes in a little bit at length to talk about how the religious impulse um, is part of our basic humanity. This is a, an understanding that he's operating with. Okay, so technology. How does this work itself out in our use of technology? The seculosity of technology. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm taking this a little bit out of order. The chapter on technology is actually chapter four. Okay, it doesn't come till a few chapters into his book, but the reason that I moved it to the first session is that every single thing that he talks about in this book, this is kind of hovering awkwardly in the background behind it, okay? So when we talk about, for instance, parenting and food and what all those other things um, that we'll talk about in successive weeks, technology and a discussion of its role in our lives is operating in all of those. So I was actually kind of surprised that it's not chapter one. Chapter one is on busyness, which we're gonna talk about, I think, next week. 
I know, get ready. Um, that, was in a, that was an especially convicting chapter for me. Um, but technology, you can't talk about busyness and being busy without also talking about the ways that technology has exacerbated our busyness and contributed to our busyness. And so we're going to talk about technology first because I think, again, it permeates the rest of what we discuss. Um, and he begins um, his chapter, chapter four, on technology with this story. Um, he says, in the early 1890s, uh, or actually he says it in the, the, the present tense because he, you know, he's a good storyteller. So he says, it's the early 1890s, right? He's putting us there, okay? It's the early 1890s and two men in Paris are overheard talking. When the bell rings, you get up and answer it, one of them asks. Why, yes, certainly, his friend replies. I'm not going to try to do a French accent, okay? So just, no. Why, yes, certainly, his French, or his, his French, <laughs> his friend replies. Um, I see, the other man says, just like a servant. This is the exchange. When the bell rings, you get up and answer it. Why, yes, certainly, I see, just like a servant. Now, the pair in question in this story are renowned artists Edgar Degas and Jean-Louis Ferrand. Uh, and the one overhearing them happens to be someone we also may have heard of, Renoir, <laughs> actually. Um, and uh, the, the thing being discussed is the telephone, the telephone, which uh, Jean-Louis Ferrand was one of the first, um, and was proud of it, one of the first owners of a telephone in Paris, okay? But Degas, who is the skeptical one here, um, who says, Joe, so just like a servant, so when the bell rings, you get up and you answer it, um, he could see a little bit uh, the trap into which all of us were about to fall, right? Um, he could see how quickly his friend had become a servant to a device that was initially meant to serve him, to be in service of him, right? Um, now, we all know that phones, computers, and the like provide ample distraction in our lives. This is absolutely no news to anybody, okay? In fact, actually, I've felt mine buzz a couple, time in my, a couple of times in my pocket, and it, like, temporarily takes me out of what I'm doing. Um, they can all be ample uh, means of distraction. And we also know that social media in our lives provides an unhealthy relationship to our self-confidence. And as both of these things have contributed to this increased frenetic pace of our lives and changed the way that we interact with ourselves and with one another, we know that. I mean, uh, more than a century and some change on from this exchange about the telephone, uh, we probably would say that we are slaves to the devices in our pockets far more than... Uh, you know, Ferrand was to his telephone that rang in his room in Paris. Um, and while we're talking about technology writ large, like just all kind of technological advances in this chapter, one of the things that I noticed about it when reading through it again um, in preparation for this class is the easy way in which uh, even David Zoll starts to slip into uh, referring to technology simply as the internet almost. You know, like that, that somehow the internet has become just technology, right? It, it's sort of become a cipher for just all of technology, even though the chapter is about so much more than that. Um, I notice how even he sort of subconsciously will be talking about technology as all the sort of modern advances that are meant for our convenience. And then in one sentence later, he'll just be talking about social media and the internet, right? Um, and I think that's indicative of the way we also think, because I tend to think about technological advances as only really being about these, um, and not, for instance, about like my dishwasher. You know what I mean? But, he, but, but that too is, is, is for our convenience, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But he says uh, on pages 69 and 70 of the book, he says, a friend recently described the internet and I think part of why he refers to the internet as shorthand for technology is because of the way not only has it dominated our lives, but my dishwasher hasn't impacted the way that I relate to my neighbor, at least not that I'm aware, right? In the same way that the internet has impacted the way that we relate to neighbors, right? The internet has changed the way we relate to one another in a way that like my vacuum cleaner hasn't done. And I, so I think that's why he kind of slips into talking about them. But anyway, there's this quote, he says, a friend recently described the internet as, quote, just like the, the real world, but with all the forgiveness vacuumed out. 
<laughs> just like the real world, but with all the forgiveness vacuumed out. And what he meant was that the web, by its very nature, privileges economy over precision, telling over showing, and yelling over telling, is all right. Opinions must be pronounced as quickly and stridently as possible if they are to register on our personal scoreboard. As James Hamblin puts it, the internet launders outrage and returns it to us as validation in the form of likes and stars and hearts. I felt like, man, that was a, that was a gut punch kind of quote, you know. Um, now, anyway. Like I've already said, it isn't that technology is inherently bad, even smartphones or the internet, but it can become that way if we aren't careful, especially the way that the internet has changed and transformed our way of relating to one another and doing business. Now he says this, seculosity comes into play when technology ceases to be a vehicle for chasing enoughness and becomes the actual source of it. Among the many ways that we harness technology as a, quote, guilt management system, the four most popular fall under the headings of optimization, information, distraction, and affirmation. Okay, these four things, optimization, information, distraction, and affirmation. And so we're going to take each one of these in turn and talk about them. And like I said, you'll see places where the internet is kind of what he's talking about, but then he sort of slips into talking about just technological advancement writ large. But all four of these things, especially optimization, okay, are things that you will see pop up in other chapters as well. Um, especially, for instance, in the chapter on romance, it talks about the way that these things, optimization, we want to optimize our lives, and because of the internet, in theory, your pool of potential mates is like the world. Right? And he talks about how this is kind of drives us into these weird places. Uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But you'll see how these four things actually play out throughout the book. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about optimization. I'm just going to put all of these up here. I think these are all. I don't want to hit it again because I can't see my next slide and I don't want it to go. Well, we'll just we'll play with fire. Oh, no. Okay. All right. So that was the last one. I'll leave these up here. Um, so he talks about how technology promises that we can optimize everything. Our time, our finances, our bodies, our sleep, even our relationships, as I just said. And of course, the internet factors heavily into this, but it's not exclusively present here. I mean, um, one of the things that, like my dishwasher, is supposed to help me do is optimize my time, because I don't have to sit there in theory, right, and scrub so many dishes. So I have more time to do other things, right? This is how technology is, it's, this is the promise of tomorrow, right, that we'll have more free time because we have all of these devices that can do things for us. And this has started to, um, this language, especially of computers, he talks about, has started to creep into the ways that we describe ourselves. So when we talk about ourselves, we often refer to our, you know, our memory bank, our hard drive, we talk about uh, upgrading our system, talk about unplugging ourselves and plugging us back in again, right? To talk about just doing normal human things, we started to refer to ourselves, he says, as androids. <laughs> and, and part of, of what you can do to a computer is you can upgrade it and optimize it, right? Uh, and so we start to think about that for ourselves, that we can upgrade ourselves, optimize ourselves, that we could do things better and better and better. And he calls this uh, techno-solutionism, techno-solutionism, that we can kind of technologize ourselves into being our optimal and best self. Now, he, uh, in his discussion of this in the book, uh, he talks about that the religious ramifications uh, of this are, are many, uh, but that when taken to an extreme, you find things like transhumanism, which seeks to transcend our human condition by means of technological advancement. It's a kind of a whole field of thought, school of thought. Um, and in its most extreme and kind of horrible forms, you get things like eugenics, uh, because eugenics is just a way of trying to transcend human limitation, uh, right? I mean, that's part of what that is. And so he talks about that in the book, how this definitely has religious, you know, we can talk about kind of the more 
mundane aspects of this or, or kind of pedestrian aspects of this, of just trying to manage your time better, but actually when taken to an extreme, they can get pretty severe, right? I mean, this can, this can have pretty significant uh, application. But he says that when we're thinking of optimization, we aren't machines, right? We just aren't. We aren't machines. We don't quite work that way. And so by chasing optimization, especially this kind of ultimate optimization, we will forever be hitting the limits of our humanity and thus will always feel like we are not enough, right? This concept of enoughness comes back again, right? We will never be enough because we can never be optimal in this way. And so we feel this perceived lack in that distance between. So this is what he says about optimization and technology. Then he goes on to talk about information, because information is one of the ways that we try to optimize ourselves. Now here he talks about how we have more information at our fingertips than ever, but this isn't just information in the sense of like, I can Google something, right? Um, he also talks about we have more information just about us. We have more data points to measure, right? I have a, an old normal watch like that just ticks and tells me the time. And I do that because I'm scared of having an Apple watch that could also tell me a whole bunch of other things about me that I probably don't want to know. Okay, how many steps you take? Uh, how long you slept? Did you wake up in the middle of the night? Did you roll over too many times? Um, did somebody email you? You know, all of these sorts of, of data points that we have about ourselves. Um, how many miles you run, if you like, you know, fitness tracker things. Um, all of that stuff. We have so many ways to measure things about ourselves and others that we never had before to measure. Like, we never had these at our fingertips in quite the same way. Um, and so having all of this data means that there are fewer and fewer parts of our lives that aren't quantified, right? Now, none of this, again, I want to be clear, none of this is inherently bad. Tracking your steps can be a good thing, right? How uh, being able to set personal goals for all that, like that's not inherently bad. But what it can lead us to um, when we quantify so much means that we are measuring it and measurement can very easily and almost inevitably lead to comparison, right? Well, you see somebody posts their, and a lot of this posts automatically to your Facebook page, right? So I've got some friends I have very flat feet. I don't really run. This needs to be stated. My feet are so flat that um, actually, Monday, Thursday, I'm glad we kind of have carpet because um, if we had stone floor, you can hear me coming on Monday, Thursday because my feet suction cup to the stone. And then in seminary, this was horrible because we, um, All Saints Chapel at Sewanee is this huge and beautiful, glorious, glorious building. And it has these amazing tile floors. And as seminarians, we'd all get in the line and I'd have to arch my feet out like this so they wouldn't <laughs> across the floor and echo, you know, in this grand space. But anyway, all that to say, I don't run. Okay. I don't run. That's not what I do for exercise. Um, and so, but I have a lot of friends who do and they run and they, they, uh, you know, have like they're on Strava or one of these things, and it will post like how, what they ran each day. And I'm like, how good for you? Like, goodness gracious, like 12 miles? Oh my gosh, you know, like as they're training for marathons and things. And I won't lie that while I, it is not gonna be motivating enough to make me go run 12 miles, okay? I will tell you that when I see that, I'm like, oh man, I, do, I don't do any of that. You know what I mean? There is that moment where I see it and I can't help but compare, <laughs> you know, like, wow. And so this is what happens, right? If we're not careful and we're not aware of ourselves as we're kind of measuring all of these things. Um, and so the trap for us, therefore, becomes that even the most mundane tasks can become fuel for us, one, to judge other people, but two, to judge ourselves, right? And so David Zoll says, no wonder we just sit here and wonder whether we're enough because all we have are measurements all around us to compare ourselves to in a way that we've never had quite before, right? So this is what he means when he talks about, um, about information. Now, bizarrely, and I don't know why this is in that little portion of the book, but I mentioned um, how, uh, you know, even though a lot of the stuff he discusses have to, has to do with the internet, that he also is just really talking about technology in general. And there's a passage um, that comes around this, this section of the book that I want to read to you that, again, is a little bit of a non sequitur to this 
slide, but it's in this section. But I want to read it because it resonated and actually forms the basis of one of our discussion questions. So I want to read it. He says, um, when he's talking about uh, how having these, the, the context of this quote is that he's talking about the ways in which, which advances in technology start to change the, the, um, the standard. Right? They raise the bar, they change the standard of our expectations for ourselves. And so he, he, he talks about this. He says, historical parallels for this phenomenon of comparison you know, abound. He said, toward the end of the 19th century, quote unquote, labor saving devices promised to transform the lives of housewives and domestic servants across Europe and North America. He said, thanks to technological innovations like the vacuum cleaner, a carpet could be spotless in just a matter of minutes. Washing machines made time-consuming contraptions like the mangle obsolete. Yet, as the historian Ruth Schwartz Cowan demonstrates in her 1983 book, More Work for Mother, the result was not an increase in leisure time amongst those charged with doing the housework, but instead, as the efficiency of housework increased, so too did the standards of cleanliness and domestic order that people came to expect. Now that the hallway carpet could be kept spotless, it had to be, right? Because it was easy to do. Um, now that fraying sleeves could be easily mended, they were all but outlawed. In a similar way, now that we can respond to work emails in bed at midnight, we are expected to do. As righteousness escalates, he says, so too does burnout, right? So as we have all of these ways of measuring and comparing, it starts to raise the bar and raise the standard. And your inbox, I didn't mention this because we are going to talk a lot about it and busyness, um, but the inbox is one of those data points that he mentions that the number of emails you have and are you staying on top of it and all that sort of stuff, that's one more data point we have about ourselves that we can use to compare how we're doing or not. Um, so anyway, but this idea of that standard being raised and therefore again, we struggling to find this enoughness is there. So, okay, distraction. Let's talk about this very quickly and we'll get to our questions. Um, this one's pretty easy, I think, because we all know, we all know how technology can distract us. Um, he talks about the advent of smartphones um, in instituting a world without boredom because you no longer have to be bored. You know, I mean, before you could just pull your phone out and start scrolling through stuff, you just had to stare at the wall or whatever, right? You couldn't, you, you had to let your mind wander. I was recently listening to a podcast, actually, with a guy who researches attention. Um, because it's been a, a New Year's resolution of mine to be a better steward of my attention, to spend my, t not, not to be a better steward of my time, because I realized that was not working out, but to be a better steward of my attention, what I devote my energy to. And I was listening to this podcast with this guy who studies our attention, and he says that actually letting your mind wander was a really valuable form of attention that we no longer really do. And you can see it in younger generations. It's, it's a struggle because they no longer have that time. That time when your mind wandered was actually hugely productive. You, uh, you mold over problems, you worked through things you were struggling with, you made sense of things around you, and we no longer do that. Anyway, so we know how technology has, um, uh, has, has messed us up here. Um, and David Zoll talks about how, uh, by being distracted all the time, we also no longer have a chance to be as introspective as we should and need to be. And uh, he talks about, this is a quote from the book, he says, in a culture of distraction, the pauses that are built into the liturgy of a church service can be downright subversive, he says, because they point to an alternate mode of life of human being rather than human doing, as the cliche goes. It is a sacred order marked by calm rather than by effort. By calm rather than by effort. Um, and so, I mean, that's my hope for what we would all find there. But yeah, I mean, in an age of distraction, taking time to pause, pray, be quiet, that's kind of a big thing. Okay, so this is the last one, affirmation. Um, 
so this has to do with, you know, one of the things that technology allows us to do is to feel affirmed. I think we know this if, you, uh, if you're kind of addicted to seeing how many likes you get on a post. Okay, that's the easy thing. But David Zoll also talks about the ways in which our affirmation um, in a digital age works by being able to find a community of people that will affirm what you think no matter what it is. Right? Like, no matter what you think, there's somebody out there on the internet who thinks it as well and can affirm you in that without challenge. And he talks about how there's been a lot of studies done, right? That this is a way that we become more entrenched, less open, and less kind because we become siloed, we become less tolerant of difference and challenge. And of course, being on the internet, you can also hide behind an avatar, so you don't even have to be you, and you can be as mean as you want to be, and seemingly without any kind of, you know, um, any kind of consequence. And that this is having really important and, uh, and, and um, significant effects to the way that we relate to and with one another. So these are the ways that affirmation and technology um, work. Okay, there we go. So what do we do? What do we do? We've laid out kind of the problems and all of that. Well, I want to end our session today, and then we've got just about 10 minutes for some questions and discussion. Um, so what I, I want to do is conclude with the end of this chapter, actually, because I felt like he puts it better than I could summarize. And so here, here's what he says. What do we do? At the end of this chapter on the seculosity of technology, he says, the hope for those stuck in the seculosity of technology isn't hope that turns a blind eye to those things that make the internet such a desolate landscape. Here again, right, he's been talking about technology, but in the end, what is it really about? It's about the internet, right? This is where he goes. But anyway, um, it is one that accounts for and addresses them. It is hope in the reality of a God who does not abandon his creatures to their compulsions, prideful or otherwise. A God who we are told gave up control for the sake of an embittered, exhausted world, who did not come to be served, but to serve, and to make a definitive break with the endless cycle of condemnation and justification. This God, I have found, is not put off by our stubborn attempts to secure our, under our own steam what is given freely, but through forgiveness grants people like me the assurance and therefore safety to experience their pain head on. The implications are no less immediate than the technologies that seek to subvert them. According to theolo theologian Ted Peters, once we realize that we can get out of the, busy the business of justifying ourselves, the world suddenly looks different. No longer do we need to defend ourselves from a hostile world by identifying ourselves with what is good or just or true, but we can live in a world, we can love the world, as if it is our world, with or without the lines that we draw between good and evil. Perhaps this is the peace of mind evinced by Mary, who sat enwrapped at Christ's feet while her distracted sister Martha kept score and pleaded for Christ to do the same. He's, of course, uh, referring to the story in Luke chapter 10. Jesus refused then, and re he refuses now. Martha did not need technology to turn herself into an exhausted, self-justifying wreck. <laughs> Yet her failure to surrender control did not disqualify her for the one thing needful. Thank God. It formed the doorway through which Christ reached out to her. Who knows? To the extent that distraction is killing us, and we are too distracted to notice, it may be bringing us into contact with the divine in a way that no amount of carefully chosen, quietly contemplated words can. Because the God who dwells in silence does not exist independent of the noise. Nor is he waiting for you and me to calm our own storms. Miraculous as it may sound, I've heard that he even has a predilection for hopeless rationalizers and their hypocritical friends. I read it online, so it has to be true, he says. <laughs> so that's the hope that we find, is that God will meet us in our mess. I mean, that's kind of the end of each chapter, but I love how he puts it here. So in our few remaining uh, minutes together, I want to leave you with some questions for reflection. I have a couple of slides here, and you don't have to get to all of these. Um, but maybe take just a couple of minutes at your table and answer one of these. Um, 
Consider a time in your life when you were declared good enough, okay, and what did it feel like? Consider a time in your life when you were declared not good enough, and what did that feel like? And then fill in the blank down here. I will have lived a good enough life if I blank. And take just a couple of minutes and answer one or, or even all of those if you go really quickly. And we'll do this for about three minutes, and then we'll come back. All right. Well, based on the amount of chatter I was hearing, maybe y'all won't hate this so much after all, which is good. That's good. Um, I hate that we don't have enough time to really get through these today, but I did warn you, today we had more information to cover before we got to this than, um, than we had really time for uh, to do this session. Um, and I do have a couple of other slides, and I'm going to read you these questions to kind of maybe mull over in the week ahead. And in the video version of this that we'll put on YouTube, I'm going to send Duke these slides, and they'll be at the end of the video. So you can go and pull them up if you'd like to um, for your own kind of prayer and reflection. So we have these three, to consider a time in your life when you were declared good enough, what did it feel like, to consider a time in your life when you were declared not good enough, and how did that feel, and then to fill in the blank, I will have lived a good enough life if I did this. And then we've got these. So... David Zoll mentions uh, Ruth Schwartz Cowan's observation that labor-saving devices of the 20th century, vacuums, dishwashers, all that stuff, didn't reduce the labor of housekeeping, but instead increased the standards for cleanliness. How has technology made life busier or more difficult for you? Um, this is one of those where, again, I think our technology is supposed to make things easier, but I find that they just add more stuff. Add more stuff to worry about, to do, to respond to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then uh, we outlined four ways that technology can function in a religious manner. Optimization, information, distraction, and affirmation, right? We talked about each of those. Which of these are you most sympathetic to? Which of these are you least sympathetic to, right? Which one of these tends to be your pitfall, basically? Um, and then this last slide, what technologies do you use on a regular basis? How have these changed the way that you live? Behaviors, patterns, things you care about now that maybe you didn't care about uh, before. What do you keep track of? Your inbox, steps, miles run, friends, likes, dis you know, all that sort of stuff. And how do you feel when you don't meet your goal, whatever that looks like, right? If your inbox, I, I, I long gave up. I have friends who try to be at, you know, in, hashtag inbox zero. You know, they want to have, I don't know what that's about. I could never get to inbox zero. It's a mess in there. It's like, tens of thousands of emails. It's disgusting, okay? But how, how does that feel when you don't meet your goal? And then have you seen technology warp someone that you know, right? Uh, what changes did you notice in them? What effect did that change have on your relationship with them? And then maybe to flip that question and say, has technology, therefore, in your reflection, has that changed how you relate to other people, right? Well, how would somebody ask that or answer that question of you as well? Um, and so these will all be in the video. Um, and so if you want to pull these up and kind of, again, think through these this week, um, you're welcome to do that. And then next week when we join together, uh, we'll have a lot more time to discuss the tables than we did today, because uh, today we had to lay out all of that, define our terms and do all that stuff that we won't have to do next week. But I want to say thank you so much for coming this morning. And uh, thank you for being here. I hope that you'll journey with me through the rest of Lent in this class, and that you'll also join us on Wednesday night for our worship and soup supper and study on Simon Peter. That's going to be, uh, in some ways, different than this in that it's going to be very scripturally focused, whereas this is topically focused. But I actually think in a weird way they'll correspond, because I think Peter would have been falling into all these traps. Okay, and so... <laughs> So I, I think there's, there'll be some resonance between them. So before we go today, I want to offer up a prayer, uh, and then we'll, we'll head over to church. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you this day that you are gracious. I thank you that while we may continue to strive and run and move our feet as quickly as possible, trying to justify ourselves, that you are always there reminding us that you've done the hard part for us. I pray that as we continue to explore all of these different ways in our lives and in our culture, 
in which we take things that you have created for good and we make them objects of our own self-righteousness and justification. I pray that you would work in our hearts, that you would open us to your Holy Spirit, to your grace and mercy, so that when we get to Easter, it could be like a giant exhale <laughs> from all of the striving and the work that we do. I thank you for rest. I thank you for community, for the chance to gather. Pray that you would be with us as we go forth from this place, that you would guide us, lead us, and inspire us. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.